Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Henry, and I am uh, currently, uh, I'm an interventional cardiologist and currently the president of, of SKY. And uh, I am the director of the Lindner Research Center at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. And I'm delighted to be here tonight with, we have a great panel uh, in a format that we are very excited about. We're calling this in, uh, Conversations in Interventional Cardiology. And our goal is to do this um, every two months uh, and have a, what we feel is a hot topic of that, a paper that uh, has just been uh, uh, published and presented and is of interest to interventional cardiologists. So for tonight, um, I'm delighted to have uh, three uh, of the authors on the paper, Cardiology Mortality in Patients Randomized to Elective Coronary Vascularization Plus Medical Therapy or medical therapy alone, a systematic renew, uh, review and meta-analysis. And this paper was published um, simultaneous in European Heart Journal as well as a late breaking trial in Euro Intervention last week. So I think it's a really important topic for interventional cardiologists. I'm excited about this. I'm excited about doing this series. So I'm gonna start with our panelists. Um, the first will be, uh, is the new editor of the journal, uh, Jay Sky. So uh, Dr. Lansky, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Tim. It's, it's really fun to be here on this very first Conversations in Cardiology. I'm so happy to be here with so many friends. Um, so I'm Alexander Lansky. I'm thrilled to and honored to be the uh, editor in chief of the, the new journal. Uh, I'm currently um, head of uh, cardiovascular research at Yale University, and I have been here for a good decade and very much looking forward to this conversation. Great. Dr. Stone. Hi, everybody. And Tim, thank you for inviting me for, you know, these conversations, uh, Sky, and congratulations on being the president of Sky and Alexandra to your new position. So I'm Greg Stone, interventional cardiologist and director of academic affairs at the Mount Sinai Heart Health System in New York. And uh, this has obviously been a topic near and dear to my heart for many, many years. And uh, most recently I was uh, a co-principal investigator of the ischemia trial, which obviously bears heavily on this topic. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Perfect. Dr. Kariakis, my partner. Uh, Dean Kariakis, interventional cardiologist, uh, president of the Christ Hospital Heart and Vascular Institute, uh, and uh, glad to be here. Thank you for including me and uh, to be included with a couple of very good old friends. And finally, uh, Dr. Navaris uh, is the principal investigator of the um, a paper, first author, and presented at Euro Intervention. So um, after he introduces himself, he's going to start with a little introduction and some slides about the trial itself. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to discuss these findings and have an enlightened discussion after that. So I'm really keen to do so. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I am an interventional cardiologist and director of mm -hmm. research and interventional cardiology at uh, Nikolaus Copernicus University, Poland. So great pleasure for, on behalf of my university to discuss this. Great, do you wanna share your screen? Sure, uh, if Kimberly can do so, I, I, I sent her before end of the slides, it will be probably better because, okay, thank you so much. So um, if you go to full screen mode, thank you so much. So um, as uh, was mentioned before, uh, I had the pleasure to present on behalf of our co-authors and co-investigators, the cardiac mortality in patients randomized to elective coronary vascularization plus medical therapy or medical therapy alone, a systematic review and meta-analysis that was presented as a late breaking clinical trial at Europe PCR 2021 and simultaneously published in a European art journal. So next slide, please. So uh, why this study? What motivated us was that uh, all randomized trials comparing elective coronary revascularization versus medical therapy alone in stable patients with coronary artery disease were underpowered to draw conclusions on cardiac mortality. The ischemia trial, the paradigmatic trial 
that was a it's negative trial also, and it was however also in uh, underpowered to address cardiac mortality at a median follow-up of 3.2 years. However, at five-year follow-up, the trial did show fewer cumulative cardiovascular deaths in favor of the revascularization arm. So we decided that based on this background to conduct a large scale meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, comparing elective coronary revascularization versus medical therapy alone in stable patients with documented coronary artery disease. Next. So the study design is pretty much clear. We wanted to consider cardiac mortality as our primary endpoint. And uh, we wanted also to assess the outcomes at the longest available follow-up. To do so, we, uh, we decided a priori to pull the data in a, with a random effects model, which accounts for, and, and it's a conservative model accounting for variability across trials. But importantly, we considered the, the, the trials uh, as those uh, enrolling stable patients undergoing elective revascularization. Non-emergent, the non-deferrable procedure, and, the, and importantly, where clinical stability was defined by absence of symptoms or signs of ischemia at rest. In the case of post-ACS studies, uh, we wanted to be even more restrictive considering only uh, eligible studies enrolling patients who underwent a myocardial stress test as an additional indicator of stability. We wanted to explore also by pre-specified sensitivity analysis, the consistency of our effect across pre-specified subgroups, namely ACS, CTO, and CAPTCH. Uh, without these subgroups, how the effect could change. And also the impact uh, on the several potential effect modifiers like uh, follow-up duration, trial medications, and the absolute difference for MI on cardiac mortality. The, the secondary pre-specified endpoint were any MI spontaneous MI, all-cause mortality and stroke. And finally, the meta-analysis was able to pull a very large number of patients, more than 19,000 patients that were randomized to revascularization plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. Please, next slide. So here you see the results of the, for the primary endpoint. We observed a 21% highly significant reduction of cardiac mortality in favor of revascularization plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. There was a consistency of the effect, a low heterogeneity across trials, and uh, uh, importantly, uh, also visually, you see that uh, trial chronological order does not impact cardiac mortality findings. Um, go to the next, please. So uh, in order to be consistent, we observed, the, the, as you mentioned, that in a pre-specified pre pre sensitivity analysis, the consistency of reduction cardiac mortality in the subgroups without post-ACS in analysis and without CTO and in other sensitivity analysis without CAPTCH. And in parallel, we observed the consistent directional and, uh, effect on reduction also in, uh, in spontaneous MI that will be discussed. Importantly, the meta-analysis was definitive in terms of power were reached. As you see in the bottom panel, we conducted trial sequential analysis, which allowed us to confirm the crossing into the trial sequential monitoring boundaries, confirming that the firm evidence was reached to address the cardiac mortality outcome. Please go to the next. So uh, in parallel with the cardiac mortality reduction, we observed also a significant reduction of, on, of a spontaneous myocardial infarction with the identical heterogeneity and low, that was low and the 26% reduction of spontaneous MI in favor of revascularization that was also related in a significant manner uh, with, the, with the cardiac mortality reduction. Please go to the next. And uh, it, what was striking was the relationship, the direct relation observed between the cardiac mortality reduction and the follow-up duration. So that it was noted a 19% cardiac reduction per each four-year follow-up increase. And uh, importantly, there was uh, no impact of uh, trial medications, most commonly employed as uh, antithrombotic agents, statins, beta blocker, ACE inhibitors on the cardiac mortality outcome, as well as no study impact of uh, study year. Go to the next. All-cause mortality was not significantly reduced in the first analysis. On the other hand, we observed, uh, besides the fact that even in the overall analysis, there was a directional trend 
Uh, you know, we observed, however, that uh, for the cause mortality, there was publication bias that was not observed with the other outcomes. And uh, as recommended, we explored the, the reason for the publication bias. We have found a study at very high risk, uh, also that had a very high crossover rate, 66%. The deletion of this study uh, finally resulted in a significant reduction in all-cause mortality as well in favor of uh, revascularization. Go to the next. So the three things to remember are that revascularization plus medical therapy in this analysis was able to be uh, importantly reducing uh, uh, cardiac mortality by 21%. It was influenced by follow-up duration and associated with absolute difference for spontaneous myocardial infarction that persisted in all analysis. There was no publication bias, low heterogeneity. Cardiac mortality declined by 19% for each four years of follow-up duration, so that the magnitude of the reduction in cardiac mortality is clearly a function of both revascularization and follow-up length. In parallel, cardiac mortality was also related to spontaneous MI that was reduced significantly with revascularization plus medical therapy. Therefore, the benefits of revascularization on top of medical therapy are clear and the combination can achieve maximal and durable prevention of adverse events. Thank you. This analysis, additional one, will be discussed later. Great. Thank you, Eliano. And that was outstanding. And I, I think that the importance and the interest of this topic is illustrated by the fact that there's been 25 trials and almost 20,000 people randomized. And so why don't we start with Alexandra? So you are the second author of the paper and um, understand it well. Can you get, give us your highlights or your insights into this topic and what you think we should um, take home? Sure, yeah. So again, congratulations, Ileano. I think the work, uh, this is one of the more robust meta-analyses I think that I've seen and I, it was really an honor to be involved with it. Um, I, you know, I think it makes several absolutely critical points. Number one, I think sample size. We, we've never had a randomized clinical trial in interventional cardiology to address cardiovascular mortality. We simply haven't. Even, you know, putting this on a level uh, field with pharma, pharmacology trials, think about Plato, Triton, et cetera, you're, you're talking about 20,000 patients. And this meta-analysis actually, that's, that's the number of patients we ended up with, roughly 20,000 patients. And that's what we need to be able to detect a mortality difference. Um, and you, you, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be doing you know, that kind of scale clinical study in, in, um, in interventional trials. So that's number one. Number two, I think the endpoint, cardiovascular mortality, I think is a much more specific endpoint. And particularly as we look at longer term follow-up, if you use all cause mortality, you just have a lot more noise in that endpoint. And I think, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the conversation later, but, but really honing in on cardiovascular mortality, it seems to me is, is the key point. And I think, uh, again, really highlighted very nicely in, in, in this analysis. Um, the plausibility of the cardiovascular death signal. So we're looking at roughly a 20% reduction in mortality here, one in five uh, reduction in death rates. The fact that this is associated with a reduction in spontaneous myocardial infarction, uh, it's linked with a longer term follow-up, I think, again, makes it plausible. And then the third one is multivessel disease. So we know that patients with multivessel disease are at a higher risk of events uh, down the road. And, I, and again, I think it makes it you know, all the more plausible in terms of this signal. So uh, you know, we can talk about the lack of association with medical therapy. I think you know, we'll, we'll talk about that probably later. But ultimately, you know, the fourth point I'd like to make is just how robust this analysis is. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't have one, not two, but three sensitivity analyses. So if you just look at patients uh, that underwent PCI, or you excluded patients that were post-acute coronary syndromes, or patients that were treated for uh, chronic total occlusions, the results are very consistent. So again, very robust analysis. 
And then finally, I, I would say short of doing a 20,000 patient randomized clinical trial on interventional cardiology, I think this is going to be the best evidence that we have. So, so congratulations, Eliano. I think it's really phenomenal work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisan. Greg, let's go to you next. This has been a topic near and dear to your heart for a long time. Um, you've been involved in a lot of those trials, and most in, in, in particular, most recently, the ischemia trial. So give us your thoughts. Sure. Well, first of all, I'd also like to um, congratulate Eliano and the, the co-investigators. It was a terrific project, a very robust analysis. Uh, you looked at um, all of the different parameters you needed to look at, and uh, you know, I wish I was involved because I'd be very proud of it if I were you. Uh, so I also think it's an important um, analysis, but perhaps for a different reason than, than others. Um, the main reason that we treat patients with stable ischemic heart disease is to, is to give them symptomatic benefit. Uh, and we know, there's just no doubt that when you're treating people with modern and advanced symptoms, that their symptoms are gonna be improved and their quality of life is gonna be improved. Uh, with revascularization, with either PCI or bypass surgery. Um, then the question really becomes, well, is this invasive approach safe? And because if it's not safe, then you really need to exhaust medical therapies before you would consider an invasive approach. And to me, the most important take-home message from this analysis is that clearly an invasive approach with PCI is safe. Um, you can argue uh, and many of the pundits on Twitter and elsewhere are arguing, well, a lot of the data is driven by old studies in which there basically was no medical therapy. And even the long-term follow-up, a lot of those are the older therapies. And you shouldn't have included a few of the post-ACS studies that you did. And, and it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you handled those arguments very nicely in your sensitivity analyses. But regardless, the point is, is that there is no harm here. Okay, that um, PCI is clearly a safe procedure um, and it looks like it is associated with a reduction in both late myocardial infarction and probably cardiovascular mortality. Um, you'll, all cause mortality, of course, gets diluted out more and very difficult to show reduction in all cause mortality. And the longer you live free from cardiovascular mortality, you're at prone for greater risks of non cardiovascular mortality. So I think you could have uh, learned more perhaps from an individual patient data pooled um, analysis, but that's almost impossible to do with this many studies. So I think that you've demonstrated conclusively that, that PCI compared to medical therapy in stable ischemic heart disease is safe. It's associated with a small reduction in spontaneous MI and cardiovascular mortality. We shouldn't make a bigger deal of it than it is though, because the absolute difference in cardiovascular mortality was about 1.1% over a median follow-up of 5.7 years or a weighted mean follow-up of 5.7 years. So it's about 0.2% per year, a very small difference. And the MI difference is about 0.4% per year. But the point is it's going in the right direction. There is no harm here. No studies have shown an increase. No studies have shown an increase in stroke. Overall outcomes are better with revascularization meaning that there's no reason to wait if you have a patient that is symptomatic. Uh, and then finally, I, I would say that um, this clearly does not apply to patients with acute coronary syndromes in whom we know PCI reduces death and MI and recurrent ACS. It doesn't apply to left main disease. It doesn't apply to patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction where there's a survival benefit to revascularization. So these are state stable, low-risk patients with stable ischemic heart disease. And even among this population, you've shown a uh, improvement in cardiovascular survival and freedom from late myocardial infarction. Lastly, I'll say, I think that we can probably do even better. Um, I think that it, it's not really treating ischemic lesions that leads to a reduction in MI and um, mortality. It's treating vulnerable plaques, some of which are flow-limiting ischemic lesions, but many of which are not. We just saw from the ischemia trial more recently that anatomic complete revascularization is more important for freedom from cardiovascular death and MI than is functional complete revascularization. And so I think in stable ischemic heart disease, we can do an even better job um, by identifying those lesions that really place the patient at risk um, for cardiovascular death and MI. And some of those are 50 and 60% non-flow limiting lesions. We have to prove that in ongoing um, future randomized trials. 
Greg, that was outstanding. And can I just tell you, uh, I think you are one of the rational voices on Twitter. And uh, I appreciate that. I know I, I really do. I think that's really important uh, that you are thoughtful and insightful in those. And, uh, and I really uh, do appreciate that. I think it makes a difference. So, so some Dean, might say the only rational voice on Twitter, but thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Dean? Um, Dean, yeah, I'd love yeah. your comments. Well, you know, I think a lot has been covered already by Alexander and Greg, but uh, I was struck uh, and I want to applaud uh, Eliana uh, for the rigor and the methodology here. I mean, he took, uh, as recommended by Cochrane guidelines, all of the available entire body of randomized controlled trial evidence with the longest follow-up available. So the assertion that trials were cherry-picked uh, is ludicrous at this point. The observation of a 21%, as Greg's pointed out, 0.2% uh, per year. But this is the first time, Greg, we've always said PCI was safe for stable ischemic heart disease. We've never really said it was effective with respect to death MI. And we've always had to couch that comment. I think I was absolutely struck by the curves it looks like the ischemia trial if it were followed out longer. In fact, if you landmark ischemia, you've seen it with a one-year landmark, you've got about a 32% reduction in cardiac death from one to five years and a 33% reduction in spontaneous MI through five years. So it actually looks quite similar, uh, directionally consistent, almost order of magnitude consistent, it just, they didn't have a long enough follow-up in enough patients to make it conclusive. So uh, from my standpoint, this is the first time that I think we've seen enough patients follow long enough and with the rigor and with the specificity of cardiac death. And I wanna point out something that Greg touched on, this issue, an argument that goes on in Twitter that all cause death wasn't changed. We wouldn't expect a difference in all cause death. When you look at the causes of MI from the Spoon paper in CERC 2014, over a 20 year period, there's a 33% reduction uh, in uh, the occurrence of cardiac MI, cardiac related, and a increase in cancer and chronic illnesses like COPD and renal disease. And the longer you follow patients, the greater the noise the greater is the relative incidence of non-cardiac cause versus cardiac cause. And that's been shown in other long-term follow-ups. So this, I think, gives us clarity and is um, biologically plausible. plausible. Uh, and all of us believe, the other thing that wasn't mentioned yet, Tim, is the lack of correlation with period procedural MI in long-term outcome. And I think Greg's contributed to that work, whether it was Garcia, Garcia, and Stone uh, pooled analysis. Most, the vast majority of these events, very procedurally, that contributed to the early curve that you saw in ischemia, or the early curve that you've see, seen in other trials, have no impact long term. Okay, when you look at MI, have no impact on long term mortality. And I think uh, that's another very important point. So we use it as a biomarker. I think it helps power stent studies, frankly. I'm not sure it's very meaningful. A spontaneous MI is very meaningful. Congratulations, Eliana. Thank, great you, thank you, Dean. Thank you so much. And if I may add a few points, that I, uh, a couple of points, that I, uh, if there is still time, I will be happy to do so. Um, uh, read the reference to some statements that as mentioned, Greg, were given about our analysis by uh, Dr. Brian Bowden that I feel to be uh, really uh, misleading and fallacious for the several reasons. Um, the, the, with reference to the uh, importance not uh, to include older studies, Dr. Bowden stated that, uh, that older studies should not be included and only the inclusion will have mandated the uh, studies starting from 2007 the date of publication of the COURAGE trial, which uh, he claimed to be uh, a trial, paradigmatic trial of contemporary clinical practice. 
So, um, if, which was not the case because Courage Trial was published, uh, but uh, it was in an era that was before drug eluting stand. But most importantly, specifically, my answer is, should be, is also focusing on methodological and the point of view and the results. In terms of methodological point of view, Cochrane guidelines strongly discourage the, uh, the partial or subjective inclusion of studies. So they encourage uh, instead uh, the inclusion of complete trial evidence. Failure to include complete trial evidence leads to the so-called selection bias. In the case of analysis proposed by Dr. Bowden, this will lead to inclusion of studies that however would miss more than 30,000 patient years follow-up and more than 40% of the entire trial evidence leading to an average follow-up which is entirely comparable to the short follow-up of the ischemia trial. And we have learned this, also Alexandra pointed out the importance and Dean did with the follow-up. And, and importantly, in terms of methodology, we should not forget one really remarkable point that we, that we are talking about randomized trials. And the strength of randomization is the balance of the distribution of baseline characteristics for arms. In specifically, medical therapy was given in a generally comparable fashion, both to revascularization plus medical therapy and medical therapy alone, so that we could clearly analyze the effect of revascularization on top of medical therapy. And this was confirmed by all analysis that we have done, low heterogeneity, no publication bias, no impact of chronological order of the studies, estimates for sites of trials goes always on left in favor of revascularization. And importantly also the fact that the deletion of each trial would not influence absolutely the findings. With the reference to the other the last point made by uh, in several discussions regarding the fact that we cherry picked cardiac mortality and spontaneous MI downgrading the rest is entirely wrong for the following reason. Cardiac mortality was pre-specified in our analysis as the declared specifically in the Prospero database, which was a registration database before the conduction of the analysis. Cardiac mortality, as Dean clearly pointed out, is most specific and biologically plausible endpoint as stated by the consortium statement, as well as the US Preventive Task Force document. And this is so true that even the ischemia trial was able to incorporate cardiovascular and not all cause mortality as component of its, prim its primary endpoint. So, and we, we also pre specified any uh, uh, MI together with spontaneous MI and all cause mortality. But the point is that, uh, as Dean also and Alexandra uh, showed, and also Greg about the biological plausibility of vulnerable plaque, finally, uh, the, the point is that uh, spontaneous MI was uh, significantly reduced and the only one related to cardiac mortality, not periprocedural, not an MI. So uh, I think that we should be really conscious about those points. So those are, those are outstanding points. And um, I think a couple of things are just for, the, for our audience. We did invite Dr. Bowden uh, for today. And unfortunately he couldn't join us because of clinical responsibilities. And I think number two, it's really important to focus on that this is stable coronary disease. I think Greg made a really good point. This is not acute coronary syndrome. This is not left main disease. This is not uh, patients with heart failure. And, and I, so, but, and then my final one on that is, we do, re, these patients do remarkably well regardless. And the overall event rates, the in death rates are low. So the fact that you can change cardiovascular death and agree that the absolute is, um, is low, but that's because overall the absolute is low. So this has been a terrific uh, initial conversations in interventional cardiologists. I love this format, incredibly uh, insightful comments. And what I'm gonna, we're gonna do now is we're just gonna go around the room and we're gonna end with uh, implications for uh, interventional cardiologists and more importantly, uh, implications for our patients. So Alexandra, we'll start with you. Sure. Well, I think, you know, in my mind, the evidence is clear. If, you know, a patient with uh, a chronic coronary syndrome with stabilized ACS that has, uh, continues to have symptoms, you know, going with angioplasty will reduce symptoms and potentially can improve outcomes. 
and not just angina, but mortality. That's my take home from this. Greg? Well, to me, I think the important implication is that it should lower the bar or lower the threshold to which we recommend revascularization. Uh, you know, it, it always rankled that the AUC uh, almost mandated that you have a failure of two or three um, anti-angina drugs before it was appropriate to consider revascularization in many situations. And I think these data really throw that on its head, as does the main ischemia trial results. Um, revascularization in appropriate patients is safe, and it clearly relieves symptoms. And um, I think the data is quite strong that it reduces spontaneous MI, and I believe it probably does reduce cardiovascular death as well. So I think it should really be the default therapy. Uh, I think we should in, take into account as well um, what the pattern of the disease is and the likelihood of being able to get complete revascularization. Uh, and I do think, for example, if you've got, you know, if you've got a 90% proximal LAD lesion and a 90% proximal circan or right lesion, you will really likely make that patient live longer by revascularizing the patient. If you've got a lot of diffuse disease um, and the patient's got only class two angina and you're not gonna be able to get complete revascularization, that patient is probably better managed medically. So there's still a lot of room here for um, the art of medicine and weighing the individual clinical and anatomic characteristics of each patient. And of course, the patient's preferences and the patient's desire for invasive procedures versus an initial medical approach. The good thing is, is that the overall mortality is, is low enough in stable ischemic heart disease without the high risk features that there's no rush. You don't have to feel even with severe ischemia that you have to urgently um, admit the patient for revascularization. We should be having a heart team approach and you should be discussing with the patient their goals uh, for the management of their own disease and take that strongly into account. Dean? I agree. You know, one point that hasn't been made uh, yet, the, the medical regression, we talked about the relationship between spontaneous MI and cardiac death. There's also a relationship between the prevalence of multivessel disease and Greg alluded to that in his case example of LED, CERC, and right. Um, but the, to me, this gives more credence to the performance of multi-vessel DCI as well, because that was linked, if you will, to medical progression with cardiac death, the reduction in cardiac death. So I think that was another important aspect of the meta-analysis that was done that was insightful for how we treat patients. Great. So uh, again, congratulations, Aliano. I think it's really important work, and I think uh, it this is I, an incredible discussion. I think that brings up a lot of the points. Your final thoughts? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. And all I, I, I agree with the, the statements, and uh, I reconnect to them to the, um, with the reference to the fact that uh, probably there are an answer for benefit of vascularization. As we have Dean mentioned, we have seen uh, multivessel disease was an important, strong answer of the mortality reduction, as well as the follow up length. So that uh, probably the magnitude of benefit extrapolated to, to the larger sample size will be very meaningful, particularly we have calculated. We are are talking about saving thousands of lives per year only in the United States if revascularization is procedure is performed. And the, the, the higher is the number of vulnerable plaque, which is connected also to the number of, for instance, of the vessel disease affected, these benefits will be probably enhanced. So I, I'm really happy that uh, we could uh, show that uh, in this analysis. So from Sky perspective, I wanna thank everyone. This was a fantastic inaugural conversation in interventional cardiology. I hope you all enjoyed it and we look forward to many more to come over the years. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Bye-bye. Thanks, thanks, Ileana. Thank